Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's four o'clock, so I think we'll make a start. Um, welcome to the Strategic Planning Committee um, here on Tuesday, the 8th of June at the Holiday Inn. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, I know some members are new. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy your time on strategic planning. It's a very important committee, um, paves the way for um, industry and business, but, uh, you know, it's a very important committee. So um, very pleased to have you on here. And, you know, myself as chairman, welcome all your contributions. I really do. Has everybody yes. been on the course yet? Because I know it is one of the things that we have to, to do, otherwise uh, decisions could be uh, I think, challenged. I think they have, Richard, but I will let Rob Murphy, our director, update us on that one. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I've run four training sessions so far, and I've now given direct training to every member apart from one, and that's one member who will sit uh, on the southeast black and I will be getting that training in place for them before the first meeting of that committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll make a start by looking at the membership in terms of reference. Um, obviously, it's in the little table before you, but um, one thing I will add is that the Green Party representative is Martin Swinbank from ANIC. Um, but I think apart from that, it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, terms of reference and powers, um, sort of details the business that um, we, we conduct here on strategic planning. It's quite well set out there. And then we have Apologies for absence. Um, I think we have two apologies for absence today. And they are? Yes, Chair, we have apologies from Councillors Foster and Robinson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you. Minutes of the previous meeting. Minutes of the previous meeting of the Strategic Planning Committee held on Tuesday, the 2nd of March. They've been circulated. I hope everybody... Um, has had a chance to read them. Um, would someone like to move those? I'll move as a true record, Chair. Thank you very much. And the seconded? Seconded. Seconded by Richard Dodd. Thank you very much indeed. So item four on the agenda is disclosures of members' interests. Any member who has an interest in any of the two applications before us today should declare it. Any interests? No interest to declare. And that brings us on to determine a planning applications. And for the benefit of everybody, really, but especially the new members, um, I'd just like to go through the procedure that we um, go through here on strategic planning when we deal with an application. Um, First of all, um, the chair introduces the application, tells um, the members of the committee a little bit about um, the application before us. Then the officer um, presents the application, gives us any changes to recommendations, any updates. Um, but today, um, we're actually going to have a two-pronged um, slot there. We're going to have the officer speak. And then, um, for the benefit of everybody, but especially the new members, um, Rob Murphy is going to give a little presentation um, just to inform the members about um, how we arrived at the recommendation and all the work that went into it. So, uh, you know, I think that will be... Um, particularly beneficial, especially for, especially for new members. Um, we then have a, a public speaking slot. Um, the public speaking slot, um, the, the um, participants in this part of the meeting have five minutes each. Um, we have five minutes for an objector, five minutes for 
a local member or parish councillor, and then five minutes for um, a supporter. And, you know, we are quite rigid in these timings to be fair to everybody that um, presents their case. Um, we then have a, a session for questions to officers from the members, um, and then we go to the debate proper. We ask for a proposal, um, we ask that to be seconded, and then we have um, the debate itself. Um, and then after the debate, um, we go to a vote, and um, the chair has a casting vote if it is tied, um, but only in that instance. So that's a little bit about procedure, ladies and gentlemen. And then um, I think we'll proceed now to our first item on the agenda today, which is item number six. It is the construction of a footbridge, works to public rights of way, construction of soft and hard landscaping, surface and sub surface drainage, utilities and other services, boundary treatments and other associated works. And this is land to the southeast of Chase Meadows, Chase Farm Drive, Blythe, and of course, this is the Northumberland line, the new rail line from Newcastle out to the southeast corner there. You know, very important for business and industry. Um, so this is the first application we've had for this. Um, and what I'd like to do now is introduce our officer to present this case, and it is Gordon Halliday. Um, Gordon, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've already had a little bit of problem with the screen, so hopefully, hopefully things will go fairly smoothly. Um, just to start off, I'm going to, there's, there's a couple of updates. If, 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 perhaps if I give them first. Um, I was conscious when I reread the report that it didn't actually say how long um, the, the sort of planned construction time was. Um, so I've, I, I've, I've asked the applicant that. Um, the estimated construction on site of the bridge is, is 10 to 12 weeks. Um, if they get planning consent today, if the, you know, the sort of rest of the scheme um, goes ahead, um, they would hope to start in late spring, early summer next year um, with restoration of the work, which obviously involves a certain amount of um, planting, etc., um, taking place over, over the winter of 22-23. Um, the second update, and I, I don't want to preempt what the public speaker is going to say, um, but the, the, the sort of second update, um, if I can just... Um, quote something that the applicant has said to me today. It's um, subject to the committee granting permission, the applicant is prepared to meet with the residents backing onto the scheme and to discuss the detailed planting and screening proposals which would then be submitted to the authority for approval. Um, I, I was aware that in Mr Thompson's um, letter of objection, he, he, he was specifically asking for, for sort of that level of detailed consultation um, on, the, on the details of such things as the types of trees to be planted. Um, so there is an assurance from the applicant that sort of that will happen. As Councillor Thorne has said, um, the Northumberland line scheme, there's, there's a, just a few bullet points to, to introduce it. Um, reintroduction of passenger rail services between Ashington and Newcastle. The sort of line used to be called the, the Ashington and Blythe Tyne line, closed by our friend Mr Beeching, Beeching in 1964. Um, but the line has stayed open since then. Um, it's currently used for limited rail traffic, mainly to, to the Linemouth power plant. Um, over the years, that has, that has um, decreased. It used to have um, um, freight traffic associated with the smelter, etc. before that was closed down. So it still is in use. 
Um, but it's only a limited use. It's, it's only several, as, as the report points out, it's only several trains a day and, and there is nothing on Sundays. Um, by comparison, what the Northumberland line, line scheme is proposing for the reintroduction of rail services by passengers is a, is a, is a half hour frequency, starting at six o'clock in the morning and going through to 11 p.m. at night. So a, a much greater frequency, a lot, a lot more um, traffic on the line. The proposals include six new stations, five in Northumberland, one in North Tyneside, and various other rail infrastructure works. Um, most of these are going to be carried out under the Transport and Works Act rather than the Planning Act. The five other stations um, that are referred to there will all come to this committee in due course, but a lot of the stuff will be done under permitted development rights um, under the Transport and Work Act that um, Network Rail has. As part of this proposal, um, Network Rail has carried out a risk assessment of the 22 level crossings along the line. Um, on some of these, um, the proposal is to make minor improvements. On some of them, that there is no improvements required at all. Um, but at Chase Meadows, um, the pedestrian level crossing is deemed unsafe for the increased level of traffic that is being proposed. And, and that is why this application is before you today. Um, it's um, that this sort of proposal is for an overbridge to replace the existing at level crossing. I knew this would happen. Um, so that's the scheme Ashington in the north down to Central Station in the south, um, five stations in Northumberland, Ashington. Bedlington Station, Blythe Bevside, Blythe Newsham, Seton Deleville, and then Northumberland Park um, in North Tyneside before it winds its way down to, down to Newcastle. Um, anticipated about a half an hour journey time between Ashington and Newcastle. Chase Meadows Bridge is shown there um, between Blythe Bevside and, and Newsham. Um, that's the location of the application site that, that's sort of in the committee report. Um, I think the sort of main thing to, well, the, 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 the sort of, uh, there sort of is the bridge over um, the line is proposed uh, as part of the red line boundary, um, as is normal, you, you sort of get from the development site back to the um, main road and sort of that, that is also within the sort of red line boundary. The sort of main thing to notice there really is the, is the extent of housing on the, on the, on the eastern, eastern northern side of the, side of the line and the openness of the countryside on the western um, southern side of the line. A lot of that housing is relatively new, um, subject of consents that um, that Northumberland County Council and Blythe Valley Borough Council have, have given in recent years. Another, another um, drawing showing that, um, exactly the same, just, just slightly further um, afield and, and sort of showing even more so the sort of open land to the, to the south. This is where the bridge is going to go. Um, on the left-hand side of this picture, uh, of this photo, um, Chase Meadows um, housing on the right-hand side, and there sort of is this small area of, um, of, of, of sort of open land. Um, the sort of access road is off to the right, just to the, to the sort of right of that, that photograph. And um, then you've, you've sort of got the, the, the sort of vegetation along both sides of the railway line. That's, that's sort of looking north towards, towards Bebside. Um, that open area there beyond the path um, is the area that is proposed for sort of planting in order to assist in the screening of the, of, of the end couple of properties at, 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 at Chase Meadows. Um, from the other side of the road, from the south or the, or the west, um, that, that is the at-level crossing as it, as it currently is, um, showing, showing the housing beyond. 
Um, the proposed site of the bridge, slightly to the north of the, of the existing level crossing, um, is, is in that location there. Um, so you, you can see, um, for, you know, at, at level, there is um, considerable screening along the line, um, except for the, for, the, for the sort of end property, and, and also for some of the properties um, um, down line, actually. Um, once you, once you do provide the bridge, some of that um, screening becomes ineffectual because the sort of bridge is, is actually higher than the um, shrub and tree planting. Um, as part of the proposal, there is, a, there is an area of um, clearance required in order to um, provide the... Um, the, the, the sort of access steps and um, access works to the bridge, um, that's the sort of um, tree and shrub planting that sort of will be removed as part of, of this development. Um, County Ecologist um, has, has sort of no objection to that. It's, a, it's only a very small part of the existing woodland and shrubland area and the, the, the sort of county ecologist is, is content with the proposals and with the um, replacement proposals that, that, are, that are part of the application. Um, that's the, the sort of general arrangement plan showing the bridge, um, showing the, the stepped access um, up, to the, up to the bridge itself, um, various, various sort of works um, adjacent to that sort of bridge. Um, the sort of area up to the north is is back to the access road at at um, and the public highway at at Chase Meadows. Um, elevations of the bridge, um, it's got to be a certain height. Um, the the sort of height is dictated by the fact that um, that the developer wishes to remain wishes to have the, the, the sort of option of the electrification of the line in due course, the, the sort of the proposals, the existing proposals for the Northumberland line aren't to electrify it, it's to, it's to provide um, diesel units. Um, but, but in the event that electrification does become possible in later years, um, the sort of bridge has to be slightly higher to obviously accommodate the um, electrification. Um, what, these, what these show are... The, the, the sort of fact that it's painted green to, to sort of try and assist in in screening it, and there is also this um, privacy screen, which is which is up the steps um, and and along the walkway, um, the, the sort of privacy screen again to sort of provide an element of um, screening, um, so that. Um, well, in, in terms of both the residents and the, and the people that are, that are actually crossing on the bridge. Um, so, so, I mean, these are, the, are, are sort of two of the, of, of the proposals that, that are in, included within the scheme in order to reduce its impact on neighbouring residents. And I've talked already about the um, planting proposals as well. So the key issues, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, sorry, these are sort of further elevations. It's just a, a sort of different elevations of the overbridge. Um, I, I'm not going to run through the report. You've, you've, you've sort of read the report. You, you'll have seen that, 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 that um, in the officer opinion, in my opinion, that the sort of issues that are raised, principle of the development, impact on resi residential immunity, impact on biodiversity and the public rights of way considerations, um, and the report um, comes to the conclusion um, that the proposals are in accordance with the development plan and, and that the planning balance weighs in favour of, of granting permission. So the officer recommendation is to, is to grant permission subject to the planning conditions. Um, I sort of referred earlier, there, as part of the scheme, there are, there are, quite, there, there, there are quite detailed landscape proposals um, sort of affecting, you can, you can sort of see the sort of area of planting to the, um, the, the sort of main area of planting to the um, west and, 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 and south of the, of the railway line there. Um, and 
the, there is also the sort of area of planting to um, to sort of screen um, the, the sort of properties at Chase, the, the, the end property at Chase Meadows as well. Um, as I've said, there is these planting proposals are the subject um, of condition number 15, which requires a detailed scheme to be submitted and approved, and that's the sort of scheme that I've that, that, that I've said that that, that the applicant. Um, is, is, is willing and ready to engage with local residents to make sure that that, um, plant, that, that these detailed planting cons, um, proposals meet residents' requirements as far as possible. Um, the final slide, if I can get it. It's not wanting to work. Right. It, it'll probably disappear. Um, public rights of way proposals. Um, it, is a, it is a public right of way at the present time. Um, there sort of is, is comment in some of the letters of objection about, about the, the, its relatively um, low use. Um, but, I, I mean, I've, I've had detailed discussions with the public rights of way team at the county because, because one of the things that I put to them was... Um, you know, you know, was closure of this right of way an option? It would obviously, obviously, have been a cheaper option. Um, but the public rights of way team are are, are insistent that um, th that it, it is relatively well used. Um, it is that that sort of usage has every possibility of increasing because of the housing consents that that have been given and uh, and and and. And, and there are further consents that could be given in recent, in, in, in future years. Um, so, in the public rights of way team, it is important that sort of this re, is reinstated as a public right of way. In order to do that, there are some um, temporary closure and temporary diversions required, and then um, to sort of reopen on a, on a on a slightly different alignment because the sort of decking of the bridge, the, the public right of way will obviously go. go um, over the decking of the bridge, which is in a slightly different alignment to the existing right of way, so these public rights of way proposals um, would be dealt with under other consents under section two five seven of the town and country planning act um, should um, members decide to grant permission today um, one addition that, that's been omitted, th th those with eagle eyes would have noted that there was no reason given for condition 14. Um, that reason should be in, in the interests of users of the public right of way. That's, that's me finished. Chairman, thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to introduce Rob Murphin for his take on this planning yeah. application. Rob, yeah. over to you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. I'm not actually going to... Uh, try to restate the evaluation uh, that Gordon has given to you, but I'm trying to make the point that some of the issues I raised during the training, which may have set like abstracts when I was talking to them, uh, play out in this relatively straightforward application. So, so just so you're clear to how the training and the message I gave you there fit into this, is that the report very clearly you know, goes out, it describes the proposals, it gives a policy background for it. It particularly draws attention at section four to the responses from the consultees, so that is people like the ecologists, the rights of way teams, and the coal authority. And you can see there where they have no objection but would require the development to be carried out in a certain way, they have requested for particular conditions, and those are reflected in the condition list. Then we look at the responses from the public and we always set out the number of people who were directly notified uh, and the number of responses we received and what those points were raised, you know, what points were raised. So here you can see in the summary of responses, which is on the foot of page 11, the main areas of public concerns. And if I can just lead you through these, uh, and this is, the first one is that the bridge in itself isn't justified. And that issue has been addressed by the fact that there was a, uh, a rigorous look at all the level crossings on the line uh, and members should draw comfort by the fact that uh, this step was taken and that process did reveal that this site did require attention and that was covered in uh, Gordon's presentation. So while the residents can raise the point that this is not needed, uh, 
the evidence suggests that it is a rational decision to make this application. But remember, it is not for the committee to decide whether or not the applicant in itself is justified in making an application, because you will see, you will see lots of applications for lots of things. And in itself, you shouldn't be trying to attribute motive behind what are normally commercial decisions rather than operational ones. It's, you, you need to be looking at whether the scheme is acceptable on its merits. Because it's always worth bearing in mind that for every scheme, you could say, well, you should be doing X instead of Y, but there are potentially you know, an infinite number of other things you could be doing or not be doing. We are here to look at what's on the table in front of us, and the justification for it gives you the cues to explain how the task was approached, not to question the very you know, basis of the BINA scheme in itself, OK? And that's, I think I'll keep coming back to in, in future committees. Uh, then the second reasons were that, that the bridge would be a focus for antisocial behaviour and that they'd be overlooking. And those issues are covered in the report. Uh, I would note that in planning decisions, perception of harm can be a material consideration, okay? But it has to be based on some evidence. So, for example, if the police had contacted us as part of this exercise and we'd said there is a persistent problem of vandalism at this point, of, you know, obstacles being put on the tracks, uh, that could be reason to look at a different design solution. On the basis that that hasn't occurred, that, they, that if you regard the design of the bridge as being a piece of a train set, it is a, it is a standard piece of equipment because there is no justification for doing anything else different. But the design detailing of it does cover the final area of public resistance, and that's about issues we're overlooking. Okay? Then the report goes on to look at the policy base, and as Gordon said, We've then tried to tease out for your benefit what are the four main material plan considerations, in other words, the four main issues that you need to be thinking about uh, when you're weighing up this scheme. And those are Para 7.1, the principle of the development, the impact on amenity, the impact on biodiversity, and the public rights of way considerations. The report then goes through those individually. And in effect, what the conclusion does then is do that exercise I taught you through in that this is a harm versus benefit exercise. Uh, and the starting point from a policy perspective is that the scheme is acceptable, and we've drawn that from the policy base. And then the details of examinations of those issues, particularly those raised by the public, have been looked at. Uh, and the conclusion there uh, in section eight uh, is that Notwithstanding the concerns that are raised, uh, various steps have been taken to address those concerns, and that overall, that the, the, the balancing exercise here, and the wider strategic issues fit, fit into this in terms of the overall benefits from the Northumberland line, is that the overall balance falls towards them being more benefits than harms. And therefore, the application is recommended for approval and as I went through the training course, it isn't just a binary yes or no. Uh, both the benefits are realised and proper controls applied by the use of planning conditions, and then you'll see those laid out from page 18 through uh, 23. Uh, this, in many respects, is an unusual but a very straightforward application. Okay? Irrespective of the scale of application you're looking at, you need to look seriously at the issues I've been pointing at, and the policy base, the material considerations, the views of the public, and to what extent they are material, and then the overall balance and the recommendation with the conditions. Remember, and I won't go through this at every item we go through this committee, I promise you, that your role in this as well is to say, actually, yes, we can see the analysis here, but when we are looking at the, the balancing exercise, between harm and benefit, you may wish to place more emphasis on one of the dimensions here. So in terms of those material considerations we talked about, back again to uh, the appraisal at 7.1, uh, you potentially could say, irrespective of the fact that the biodiversity has been addressed, the public rights of way uh, issues have been tackled, and that the principle of development is really important, 
on any application, you could say, on this issue, even if there is only a minor impact on residential amenity, you feel that, that outweighs other issues, so you would be entitled to say, on the basis then, you want more weight to be attached to that, and that could shift the balance, okay? We will always be clear to where we think that balance is a fine one. And sometimes you will come to hear applications, which we will be honest in saying, the list of problems and the list of benefits is relatively well balanced. And your view of the vision of an area for the future is important. That in and the other issue, finally, is that when I did the training course, I said that applications aren't ballots. Okay, so the existence of the public representations in themselves, by counting them up, shouldn't be what influences your weighting, but the issues they raise, you can pay attention to. Okay? So even if one person had only raised these issues, it would be as important as if five or ten. However, if a very, very large number of people, which became a, a predominant number of the local communities, had raised the same issue, you could be well to think that actually that issue deserves to be weighted more significantly. Okay. Right. With that, uh, I'll move on, pass back to the chair. Thank you very uh, much, Rob. Thank you. I think that's been very useful, especially for the new members, so thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the public speaking slots. Um, we only have one public speaking slot, somebody wishing to object to this application, and that's Mr. Jeff Thompson. Sir, would you like to um, address us? Yes, of course. Yes. For no longer than... No longer than five minutes. Five I minutes. I understand totally. Yep. Yeah. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Jeff Thompson. Thank you. Um, there's a number of things that have come up already today which I hadn't put in my, my brief letter that I wrote, um, but I'll, I'll come on to them a little bit later. Our house backs onto the Blythentine Railway. It's not the house exactly where the uh, footbridge is proposed to be built. We're a little bit to, I guess, the southeast of that. Um, however, we do see what goes on um, on a daily basis. Um, I'd like to address the public right of way issues that you've brought up. We sometimes go across the railway line and walk with my son's dog. We've stopped doing that. It's too dangerous to walk over there with a dog. There are too many kids take alcohol over there and break the glasses when they're finished. Um, so your comment about antisocial behavior, you guys need to just go and talk to the police. We report on a regular basis to the, to the police on antisocial mm -hmm. behavior by teenagers from the local school. Myself, our neighbors, and the policeman who lives next door do it twice a month, I would say. The police don't always come out, but when they do, they round them up and take them away. So they don't do anything with them because they can't, but they're 16 year old, drinking alcohol, breaking glass. Yeah, a footbridge won't help that. It'll just mean they go over there easier than they do now. Um, if you try and walk across the field where, I don't know if you, I, I know I can't use the facility you've got, but the footpath walk goes across a farmer's field to the spine road. You can't easily cross the spine road because you have to walk across the southbound carriageway in the middle of the onco and then risk cross crossing the northbound, and when you get over there, you can't get through the fence. So the public footpath is actually blocked. So the way we look at this is a bridge to nowhere. It doesn't actually lead anywhere sensible. It runs along the edge of the golf course to the south, but the golf course don't like you going that way because the kids have already damaged the golf course a lot. So they'll stop us from going that way, even though they're not supposed to. The farmer doesn't like people going across because the kids break glass, people ride motorbikes over there. If you get to the end of the field, you can't cross the, the spine road. Put a bridge there, that would help. If the footpath went to the proposed station in Bebside, that would be great, but it doesn't. It goes to the south, it doesn't go to the north. The footpath runs on the other side of the railway line to Asda 
and then you've got to cross the spine road to get to the station, the proposed station. We don't object to the railway line. It's the best thing that's ever happened to Blythe. It will make life so much easier for us to get into Newcastle. What we don't think is right is th that a bridge is put over. There must be another solution. An automated set of gates, which must be possible. Something. Um, the other thing that was in the original information that came out was the fact that 89 people a day cross that crossing. We checked on our CCTV, we can't count 89 people unless we take into account 20 or 30 kids going in both directions. So you might need to reconsider your survey that was done. Um, what else? So a couple of things that came up today. We were talking about planting, and the planting was talked about on the south and the west side of the line, but not very much on the, on the residential side of the line, which is obviously the bit where we're going to see the bridge. So that probably needs to be thought about a little bit more carefully. As I said, we don't oppose the line at all. We just think there must be another way of crossing the railway line. And hopefully that's less than five minutes, but that's probably all I've got to say at the moment. Thank you very much for your contribution, sir. Thank you. Right, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, we now come to the slot where we can um, ask questions of the officers. Any members of the committee want to ask a question about this application to our officers? Jeff Reed. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I was just when I read the when I read the report, I was a bit um, disappointed that the rights away people hadn't put the number of people that use it every day. The kind of you know they've they've said as far as we're concerned, there's enough people to warrant it but it doesn't give us the number, and I would have liked to know if that gentleman is right at 89. Any comment about that from Gordon or Rob? Um, well, I'll make two comments on that. One, um, the Public Rights of Way team have seen the applicant's submissions and, and haven't queried the numbers that are, that are, that are in the applicant's submissions. And... The second thing is, um, I mean, our rights of way team, you know, have have a limited resource and and sort of don't have the sorts of information that that you're sort of seeking on, you know, on sort of all the on 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 on, on, on sort of lots of rights of way. Their view is that it it is sufficiently well used. That you know, I mean, I said to them, I said to them, if the proposal here was to close the right of way, would you object to that? And strongly, their answer was yes. Um, we consider that it's, it's, it's a historic right of way. Its use is likely to increase, as I've said, because of the uh, of the new housing. And, and their view is that the right of way um, needs to need, need, needs to sort of be remain. Um, I mean, what we're not considering today. Um, I, I mean. What um, Mr. Thompson has said is a, is a sort of variety of options, automatic, automated gates, um, bridge. I mean, I mean, all of these are, are sort of going to have the same um, result of, of sort of people crossing the line. And um, what, what we're not here t today to decide are the, are the actual rights of way mechanisms. It's really the, the fact that the rights of way team consider that, that the right of way needs to stay Therefore, Network Rail have deemed the, this sort of crossing to be unsafe. How are we going to accommodate that? Network Rail um, have considered the um, solution that, that, that Mr. Thompson has, has mentioned about gates and increased fencing and, and has rejected that as, as, as not being safe enough in this location and therefore they've proposed the bridge. Thank you very much, sir. And I would add to that, and just for this first application this committee is dealing with, uh, just, to rem just to put it to members as well that the existence or not of an historic right of way isn't an abstract, and that you're not just looking saying there's a right of way, therefore it needs to protect, be protected. And in itself, promoting more rights of way and opportunities 
for people to walk and undertake you know, active recreation is important strategically in terms of placemaking, particularly when you're in an area that could see more houses in the future and economic growth. I would make the point that with increased usage of any right-of-way like this, there is the risk of antisocial behaviour. And regularly, we are requested to, to close off shortcuts or snickets, or whatever they're called locally, on housing estates, because they can be where youth do congregate. However, we have to look at the wider users of the facilities and just to make sure that the antisocial behaviour issue is a matter that needs to be dealt with properly by community policing rather than letting that dictate where and where we do and do not promote public rights of way because they are of wider importance if you never help etc okay thank you sir thanks can i just, can I just come yes. back on that i haven't got an answer to my question though I, I i didn't need i didn't need an explanation what i wanted was why didn't the rights of way people say there are there are 189 people using this or whatever i don't i don't i don't need I don't need to know the, all the background of this. I'm fully aware of the, what's going on. But I just wanted to know why the figures weren't in the report. That was all. Yeah, I don't, uh, I don't yeah, need chair, any further than yeah, that. Uh, I'll bring in our highways person on this. Well, can I say, are we saying that if there was 100 users a day, it would be acceptable? Or if there was 150, it wouldn't be acceptable? We are, we are saying that the Public Rights of Way team have said as part of the strategic network, it is regarded as being important, it keeps open. Uh, we do not have precise figures every single, for every single stretch of the, uh, of the huge network of rights away in the county. What we do have though, and, it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to give a precise figure, but what we do have is we have crossings of this particular point, because that's, that was what the safety analysis was based on, but that might not be the same as an accurate picture of overall usage of the of that section of the right of way. So can I bring in Matthew for this? Yeah, one? thanks, thanks, Rob. Uh, Catherine, From our highways team. Yeah, um, just looking at the data um, that's been submitted, there is a level crossing count census submitted with the application, which is where the the 89 pedestrians uh, each day figure comes from that uh, the public speaker mentioned. So there is there has been information submitted to the application in the form of a census undertaken. Um, in June 2019, I think is the date of the of the original data. So there, there is the data. Obviously, it's not made its way into the into the report. Thank you, Matthew. Are you content, Jeff? Yeah. Um, But I think the, the, po the point is, too, you know, we've got a, a lot of housing um, planned for that particular area. And I think, you know, we're looking to the future and usage will increase. And obviously, you know, the, the railway line is, is going to be a different animal when, um, you know, it's transporting all these passengers. But, yes, point well made. Thank you. Georgina, you've got a question? No, I didn't. Gordon, did you have your hand up as well? Georgina. Georgina and then Gordon. Thank you. Um, I thought that was really helpful, Rob's discussion, as, as ever, about the harm and the um, benefit argument. It does seem to me, unlike other applications I've seen, which quite crazy cases have been made for benefit, um, there's a clear benefit. Just what I wanted to ask, and, and I'm not going on... Um, which were not meant to about motivations. But one thing that's going through my mind is, is that bridges are really expensive to build. Um, and it's not something... I mean, there's loads of areas that you pass and think, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a bridge? Um, railway crossings, which are notoriously dangerous. Other road areas, and everyone knows they're really expensive. So surely there must be a very strong public safety case or something for them to go to the expense of a bridge. And just to throw in a specific question, if you want to comment on, on my comment there, uh, about any uh, comment for disabled access? Yeah. I'll answer that in two, two parts. Uh, firstly, I think 
by the fact that we are talking about a significant intensification use, uh, intensification of the use of this line to a, to a fully fledged passenger line, uh, a clear exercise was taken to look at all 22 level crossings and the public purse does not spend it, spend the money on this sort of issue from Network Rail where they think, well, it's not really justified. And I think that's probably evidence, to answer your question, by the fact that out of the 22 level crossings, only one has been deemed to, for, for to be justification for a bridge. Uh, and that in itself, I think, well, I would, I would suggest to you that from a pers from perspective of using logic on this, if they said, OK, put a bridge on all 22, that would be evidence of a somewhat cavalier approach to it. Or if they'd said none, that would be the, a message that they, they'd set out the intention of not putting any bridges in. But here, this site was identified as needing an intervention, and they did look at alternatives. And in this location, the bridge was deemed to be the most safe and appropriate solution. OK. Uh, Gordon, should you come in in terms of the design detailing on this, on this precise model of bridge about the access for those with less mobility? Yeah, I mean, you've, you sort of mentioned um, access for disabled people. Ob obviously, um, this isn't going to provide access for people with disabilities. Um, so again, uh, you know, I asked Public Rights Away team, you know, are, are you content with that? And basically they are. Um, their view... Um, is that at the present time there is no evidence that it is used, I, I won't say at all, but, 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 but there, there is no evidence that it, that, that it is in demand by people with disabilities. Um, therefore, you know, they are content with the stepped access. Um, one of the options that was looked at by the applicant was a, a ramped access. The problem with a ramped access is that you you sort of start to get a lot of the problems that, that sort of Mr. Thompson's referred to. I mean, you, you need more land. Um, it's, it's sort of more visually intrusive. Um, and, uh, you know, arguably, um, it would be a focus for sort of more antisocial... You know, you, you, you could imagine people, you know, skateboarding down it and, 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 and things like that. So, I mean, it, it was looked at, and the public rights of way team are content with the solution that's been proposed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And just, just to add on to your point about the decision-making systems beyond the design process here, is that in some areas, clearly, a ramped solution would be deemed to be necessary and appropriate. Okay. So, so a process has gone on behind this to arrive at this uh, design solution. Okay. Thank you. Gordon, you've got a question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Obviously, I welcome this, and as the, the resident there said before, I think this is a major investment, so it's great that the government's looking at this. There was a, an image of a bridge there. I would have liked to have seen some more information about that. It, what's it made of? And, you know, are we trampling up on the bridge? Is it going to be a lot of noise because it's in a residential area there? Um, and around that area, a railway line, I don't know how big the sidings are, what's the acoustics going to be like? Is there going to be a lot of echoing along the railway line. And on the back of that, you talk about screening. Is that basically just planting of trees and bushes? And I think, looking at the video the other day, um, there are actually deciduous trees there at the moment. So I know you're going to go into great detail after this if it does go through today. Um, but in reality, that is something so important for the residents living around there if we get the, the screening absolutely right for them. So there's two parts of it, please. Yeah, well, certainly in terms of screening, it, 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 would, <coughs> it would be deciduous trees. <coughs> but again, <coughs> that would be, it would be prescribed in the, <coughs> goodness me, it would be prescribed in the detailed landscaping scheme that, that was submitted. <coughs> goodness me. Um, sorry, your first point was, the, the, well, yes, it was on the, uh, well, it, well, basically, it's a metal construction, um, it, it, in, in terms of, of, of things like the, um, the sort of surfacing, um, my expectation would be, and, and, and again, it's, there's a condition requiring further details to be submitted, but, but sort of my expectation would be um, that, that the surfacing would be of, of a non-slip variety, which, which sort of would, would, would also have a cushioning effect. 
um, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of a bridge over, over the over the over, over the metro at Jesmond, um, next to Jesmond Station, and 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 there. Um, there is no, there is no noise. There is no echoing. You sort of walk up the bridge, and it's, uh, it's like the sort of material that is that, it, that is that is often used in, in children's play parks. It's, you know, so it's safety, so that sort of if, it, it, so that people don't slip if it if it gets icy or or if it gets wet, um, and uh, and it and, and and also it safeguards against people falling. So my expectation is that that would be included in the detail of the construction. Share the expectations of that, but actually come up with reality. Yeah. Um, we have what, low yeah. acoustic noise. Yeah. What we can do, and this is a good example for us, the committee, of how we can fine tune the conditions because uh, problems to local amenity, having seen obviously many, many thousands of schemes, often take place during the construction phase rather than the operational phase. So there are conditions on here which control the actual construction phase and there's a construction management plan requirement and that includes noise, etc. What we can do though is we can add a slight amendment onto the condition where uh, we can add on a sentence, well, uh, add on a commered section saying to include details of low noise, say, uh, low noise surfacing arrangements for the bridge, Gordon? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think what condition says is, notwithstanding the details submitted prior to the commencement of development, samples of all materials, colours and finishes to be used on all external surfaces shall be submitted. You know, so that's, that's the opportunity, um, yeah. you know, for... What we couldn't... Yeah. 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 yeah, what we can do, we can add on to that, uh, uh, is... Yeah, we could amend the condition uh, to put on uh, deta details, uh, including, uh, I'm trying to think of the correct terminology here, uh, acoustically appropriate yes, I mean, materials. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. clearly, if this was in the middle of an, in an industrial estate, uh, the clattering of noise on an exposed surface wouldn't matter as much as uh, in a more sensitive areas. So if you can just add on a, like a paragraph point using the phrase acoustically appropriate or I think that's probably going to be the right term yeah. so again for members see, that was an example of where the council had a particular issue and we're not saying that through the, the yes or no to the application uh, that could be tattled but it's the way and the how the application has been done okay Yes, I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I mean in, in terms of noise in general public protection have, have considered um, noise issues arising from from this development, um, in particular the, the you know the sort of noise from the trains themselves. Um, but we we could certainly amend condition three in the way that Rob's described to sort of highlight that particular aspect. Thank if, you. If members were minded to support the application, so what will happen is that the that if we reach a the position where one of you uh, puts forward the suggestion that this application be approved subject to the conditions it will be it would the motion would be that this application will be approved subject to the conditions with the amendment that we've just discussed okay. thank is you it, Rob. is everyone clear about that sort of process yeah. that are you good? happy council Stuart? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh well hope it's a high level um any more mem members got any questions this afternoon councillor wallace alex thanks chair it's it's quite evident from what everybody's saying there's going to be an increase of pedestrians across there. And they're going to use the footbridge of the planning applications it goes through the day. And Mr. Halliday mentioned the privacy screen. Now, the privacy screen's obviously so people don't look into people's houses. Unfortunately, footbridges attract self-harming and suicide. As recently as January of this year, there was two suicides in Chesley Street on a rail line. Network Rail and the county, I'm quite confident, want to discourage that. So may I ask, what height will that privacy screen be and will it take into consideration measures to prevent such things as self-harming and suicide? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a well-made point. I would say that that issue would be much more significant for a design of a bridge where there was no other access to the railway line. Here, 
you know, there's, you know, it, it, it's not impossible at the side, you know, to make your way round to X the railway line. However, Gordon, can you just tell us the height of the? Um, I, I, I believe it's about 1.8 meters. Um, yeah. You know, you know, so it's it, it it's of a height of, you know, the, um, to you know, so that so that people can't can't see over it, uh, as you as, as you've said. Yeah, and uh, and that will have the dual benefit of it. It's for people of an average height or less that I assume will be difficult to climb over. Uh, we can't design this out completely. I would say, though, had this been going through an area where there was a very significant drop and there was no other access to the railway line and it was a high-speed railway line, it may have been worth considering a covered bridge to address the issue we're talking about here. I don't think that is particularly justified, but it's, a, again, another point well made. Thank to you. the issue with regards to disabled access <coughs> and mobility in push chairs. We are saying that we need this bridge because increased usage and potential extra housing in this area. Obviously, with that becomes more potential use of people with mobility issues, push chairs, etc. Um, so I just think that does need to be a consideration. And also, with trains going from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m., personally, the safety of the bridge as well, when in darkness, what about lighting and CCTV, just for the safety aspect? Thank, Thank you. you. Um, well, over to you. Well, there's no lighting or CCD, C, CCTV proposed. I mean, I think I think lighting would bring it, it bring its own um, other issues of um, detriment to visual immunity. Um, again, I've, I, I, I did go back and, and, and sort of put this point about um, mobility. The, the, the public right to the, to, the, to the public rights of way team. I mean, I mean, I mean, their view is is not just that it that it isn't um, existingly well used by people with pushchair or people with disabilities, <coughs> but the likely demand for that sort of use is not likely to be great, given, given what there is on the southern, sorry, on the northern western side of the line. So you're not talking about um, a bridge that is going from one residential area to a shop, for example. You're talking about a bridge that is going from a residential area to an area of open space um, through a woodland, um, along a golf course, and, and not the sort of um, area that is likely to be in great demand um, by people um, with, with push chairs. I mean, what there is, um, about, about, 600, about 600 metres north of here, as part of the Bevside station proposal, um, there sort of is a proposal for a, for a crossing of the A189 that sort of would provide um, disabled and um, and, and, and sort of push chair access. Um, I, again, I asked the, the sort of rights of way team, given that that's going to be proposed, you know, subject to getting planning consent in due course, wouldn't that be enough? But again, the public rights of way team considered that no, in their view, this right of way is sufficiently important that it needs to be retained and, and they are content um, with the stepped access. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bohr. Thank you. Any more questions this afternoon? Councillor Reid. I don't know whether this is appropriate, and I don't know whether anyone here will know, so I'm quite happy to be told. How are we going to get it there? <laughs> yeah. Sure yeah. Uh, yeah. Could, <laughs> now, uh, and this is one of the issues can, I said on, uh, again, this is again for benefit of the new members as well, is that when all manner of development schemes are approved, we do often have lots of tension with local residents during the construction phase because of things like the delivery of abnormal, abnormally large loads, etc. So, what we've taken to, particularly in the you know in, in, in the recent period, is ramping up the amount of conditions we put on for method statements to be agreed beforehand, and so the complaints can be looked into, and that we can understand in advance of construction starting how it's going to be done. Because if there's a need for unusually large loads, 
there is a system of prior notification for that to our highways people because sometimes you have to do even things like I'm not saying it will be on this one but sometimes you sometimes have to take out lamp posts and traffic lights to get very large loads around and we will need to look at how large loads are going to come to this site to make sure that we have enough notice to put in place provisions to enable it to be done safely okay. yes i mean i mean my understanding and unlike certain bridges it, it isn't a bridge that is that is going to be transported in in one it, it, it is going to be in 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 sort of many 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 sections and you know but but as robert said that there sort of is a condition that sort of does does require details of their um, of, yeah. of, of their deliveries and access and you know sort of Math Matthew will be involved in, in the assessment yeah. of that yeah and just what I would add on to that Jeff is is that the reason why we put that condition on even though as Gordon said it sounds like the applicant have said it can be delivered as a Meccano set rather than a finished product we need to cover the the possibility that a different precise model of bridge may be available via suppliers and there may actually be need for large elements of structural yeah, steel work to be delivered in one go. So the condition gives us the controls over the construction phase. Yeah, you know, it'll have to be it'll have to be craned yeah, yeah. Well and the access for the actual crane equipment as well is important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions, ladies and gentlemen? No. Um, would someone like to move a recommendation for this application? Barry, I think you had your hand up first. Uh, yeah, I'd like to move approval. Um, I'm open to the idea of including the condition which was mentioned on Councillor Stewart's um, question, if that's okay. Yeah. And yeah. I think we'll, at this point we'll ask Melanie to read what that condition so, is. Um, I've amended it. It's condition three, so it will read, notwithstanding the details submitted, prior to the commencement of development, samples of all materials, including acoustically appropriate materials, colours and finishes to be used on all external surfaces, shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Thereafter, the development shall be carried out in accordance with the approved details. Yes, that's what I'd like to Thank propose. Thank and you. is that seconded? And that is Councillor Hutchinson seconding. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, um, have you anything further you'd like to add to this application today? Councillor Jeff Reed. Because I don't think it's right, to be honest. I think it's it's taking a sledgehammer to crack a nut. If that's got to be, I don't know, two million quid's worth of bridge for 89 people who are then going to cross it to a field that, down a path that doesn't lead anywhere, that leads to a dual carriageway, that if you don't, if you're not watch where you're going, you roll down and get hit by a car. I mean it. It just hasn't been thought, this whole thing has not been thought through properly. I realise it's not, you know, as a planning department and as a planning authority, it's not up to us to tell people what they should apply for. But I just think this solution is just nuts. So I'm not going to vote for it. Fine. Um, you know what I would say is, you know, sometimes a right of way... Um, they say it goes nowhere, but, you know, it leads from um, a housing estate with an awful lot of houses into the open countryside. And often, you know, there doesn't have to be a destination. It's a right of way that gives people the opportunity to leave their sort of built up area and go out into the countryside. And I think, um, you know, from my point of view, um, it would be a shame, a big shame to say no to blocking up this right of way. Um, this is um, an application to try and make that passage as safe as possible. I know it's, it's, it's um, a big bridge, but um, you know, sometimes it needs a big solution to a little problem. And you know, I, I think this has been thought through well. Our planners have put a lot of thought and time into this. Um, but obviously it's up to the members of the committee to decide. Any more contributions today? Councillor Hutchinson. Thank you, Chair. I think we're 
going around the houses with this one, actually. Um, I think, listen to what Rob said at the very start. This is to everybody, not just the new members. But it's on something on balance. And it's, you can't really take into account the right of way, basically. It's already there. And I've been sat on rights of way for a few years in the past. Um, and there are quite a few rights of way which lead nowhere. They lead to a dead end. And we can never get our heads around why that was, but it was, it's, it's true, it does happen. They go to a dead end. This is going, going to go to a dead end. And this is a safety aspect for people using the right of way. It, to me, it's, it's a must. This has to go ahead. And I think we've wasted a lot of time debating the reasons it shouldn't. And I can't find a reason why not, so yeah. as far as I'm concerned, that's why I seconded it. Well, Councillor Hutchinson, I'd just pull you up. I don't think we've wasted any time today. I think, especially for the new members, it's important to get all the the, the pros and cons. It's, um, it's, it's that debate. And, you know, I think if we just sort of um, sailed something through, it would be a shame. You know, I think um, members of the committee have asked searching questions, and I think, you know, it's important that we do. It is. Very true, Chairman. I withdraw that statement. <laughs> Councillor Swinburne. Swinbank, sorry. Swinbank. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, well, I'm going to support. Um, basically, we have a situation where we have uh, a railway line which is dividing people um, in housing estates from a green space. And uh, we've seen, particularly we've seen over the last year, the importance of green spaces into people's lives, particularly when they couldn't go very far. Now, thankfully, now we can go a bit further, but I'm sure that the people that actually use that green space value that immensely. And uh, it's not just physical, but it's also the mental benefits of the green space. So, um, yes, it's a, it's a quite a large bridge. Yes, it po possibly could be slightly better if it, it had uh, disabled access, but, um, but obviously that's going to be a more expensive option. Um, so for those that use it, um, and it, indeed those that will use it in the future, um, I think it's the, the right solution in the right place, um, notwithstanding the, uh, the objections from uh, members of the public. Um, I think it'll, be, it'll, it'll blend in in time. Um, it'll be screened well enough. And uh, I think uh, it should be supported. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Any more contributions today? No more contributions? Um, well, you know, from the chair, I'll, I'll just sum up very briefly. Um, the, um, the line is a very important line. It's, it's, it's connecting Newcastle to southeast um, Northumberland, um, bringing huge benefits in communication um, and, you know, I think will help both parts, both Newcastle and the South East, to connect much better. Um, this is an instance where we're um, making um, a footbridge to improve pedestrian safety um, in quite a, a, a built-up area. Um, and I think our planning department have worked well here, been quite thorough, um, thought about landscaping, the colour of the bridge, um, and hopefully with that extra condition um, on acoustic appropriate, um, we can make it um, even better. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a... a I will ask Barry if he wants to make a contribution. Sorry. Yeah, I'll just sum up as a proposer. OK, sir. Ba basically, all I, all I would say is I have a, a lot of sympathy for the residents who live there because of, you wouldn't have expected it when you moved there, um, clearly. Yeah. Um, however, I really would worry that if we turn this down today, that we would then consider what we do next, whether we'd have to um, be delays to the entire scheme from Ashington to... Um, down to Newcastle, whether there would be, we'd get into a whole, you know, elephant trap of a rights of way issue coming up and where we shut a rights of way, we wanted to stop a rights of way and then we'd have people petitioning against it or what have we, a normal thing that happens with that. Um, uh, that would concern me greatly. Um, I don't suppose um, with the whole scheme that we particularly wanted to, the, the people behind the scheme particularly wanted to do this, but they've got to. 
um, on, the, on the advice they've been given. They've got to do something, um, and this is what they've come up with. And I think, um, I think the concerns that you have about antisocial behaviour and such like, I think they do need to be probably dealt with by a different mechanism other than planning, which is possibly your town council, or it's possibly a county council, or it's possibly your local police. Um, but I do think that I would be very concerned if this was turned down um, and we led into all sorts of trouble delivering um, an absolutely imperative scheme for the southeast area of Northumberland. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, um, this application has been moved and seconded with that amended condition. Um, how are we taking the vote today, Melanie? Yeah. Are we asking for a show of hands yeah. as our normal way? So, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, all those in favour of this application, would you like to raise your hand? Twelve. Those against? Two. Two. Any abstentions? No. no. That's everybody. Well, yeah, yeah. So that application, ladies and gentlemen, is passed. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now go on to our second application this afternoon. Um, and this is a full application for the change of use from agricultural land to an industrial site for the erection of a manufacturing building with offices, showroom, parking, um, which is for the relocation of an existing business premises, tree locate, um, and they're relocating to a purpose-built new facility. And this is on land southwest of Bricksheds, Junction B, 1342, Belford Station to Belford. And, you know, I, I'm sure you've all read the application, but essentially, um, this is a local business, a rural business in Northumberland, um, manufacturing um, plastic trees and all sorts of artificial vegetation, which um, seems to be on the up these days. Um, so that's a brief introduction. I'd now like to hand over to Haley, who will take us through this application. Haley, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, our um, helper here is just going to put it on full screen mode. Thank you. OK, thank you, Chair. If I could just take you um, through the slides in a moment. But first, I've got a couple of updates. I've got a couple of updates for you today. Um, two points. I've got um, an additional letter of um, objection from a local resident, which I'll read out for you in a moment. Um, I've also got an update to the recommendation in the report. Um, I'll deal with the recommendation in the report first, please. Um, this is on the back of um, Highways England. Um, the report does say that um, an update from Highways England will be given at the meeting today. Um, the objection that stands from Highways England uh, still stands. Um, so in theory, there is no update to the report as such. Um, their objection still stands. However, um, the um, unilateral undertaken is pending consideration with Highways England. The information that they've requested um, to seek to address their issues is currently pending with them as well. Um, to that end, Chair, we seek to amend the recommendation today to allow... Um, the issues from Highways England to be fully resolved. The recommendation to read, Chair, uh, is that this application be granted permission subject to the resolution of the objection by Highways England. The following conditions came contained within the report. Any additional conditions required by Highways England, with the wording of the same to be delegated to the Director of Planning, and a unilateral undertaking pursuant to Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act to secure the following legal obligation. Tree Locate Limited will cease all operations within the current site once they have taken occupancy of the new site. So that's a change to the recommendation, Chair. Thank you. 
Um, the second update is we have a secondary letter from a Mrs Tracy Bell from the Barn Bricksheds, um, a local resident in the area. Um, her representation, additional representation, was received yesterday evening. Um, and Chair, if it's OK, I'll read it out for you in full. I would like to strongly object to this application as it will have a de detrimental impact on five residential properties, one of which is a holiday cottage. The brick sheds is not a farm, as, start as stated in the report. I feel the whole report is, and the application is misleading and completely outdated. I dispute the staffing level at Trailer Cape Belford site. Many are temporary staff on zero contracted hours and only have few full-time members of staff. Many of the names on the report have long since left or have been laid off. I would also urge you to update the traffic report before coming to any decision. This survey was done in November 2019. Northumberland has a massive increase in tourism with Belford heavily relies on for the economy. Belford has two successful caravan parks and a farm shop and many holiday cottages. There are many caravans and mobile homes that use the junction, both sides of Station Road, east and west, and past the proposed site. The traffic report fails to show the amount of heavy goods and agricultural vehicles used in this particular junction in the harvest season. Coastal Grains Limited are located at Belford Industrial Estate. In season, this runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as to many other businesses. There's also been an influx of cyclists and pedestrians using the junction on a daily basis. The residential properties included. Belford boasts a main cycle route and St Cuthbert's Way historical, historic coastal path behind the industrial estate. I'm urging you to gain updated information before giving the green light to a new industrial estate. This location is located on a busy junction and would be a distraction. It is direct locality on the A1 and risks arise to accidents, in my opinion. The application says tree locate is to completely relocate, leaving several purpose-built and designed manufacturing units and showroom all tree locate. This land will stand to be industrial land. So how will this ease traffic on Station Road and at the junction? Belford has its own designated industrial estate for many years and on, Bel on Belford's neighbourhood plan there was no need or policy to increase industrial capacity and certainly not at the entrance to the village. I also note that on Northumberland's plan and policy Belford is not classed as a business area so again no policy. I have very serious concerns about the extra noise and pollution that we residents will suffer. We have experienced toxic smoke from tree locates, biomass, environmental health has been informed throughout the lockdown. We have found it hard to breathe at times and have been unable to sit in our gardens. This has a serious effect on our health. I have found it hard to find an, another industrial estate in rural North Northumberland so close to the A1 and a rural village. There are many unused industrial locations close to Belford, such as Annick and Berwick, with good transport links already passed. Belford is known as a hub to the gateway of a coastal beauty. We have to boast less than five miles away from this location, Budle Bay, Bambra, Lindisfarne, Holy Island, to name a few. I would urge you not to take our beautiful rural entrance to our beautiful rural village by changing a greenfield agricultural <coughs> land to create a distracting industrial site. Belford is a big part of rural Northumberland and should remain so. That's an additional representation received yesterday evening, Chair. Thank you. Um, and that's read out in full. Thank you. If I could just take you to the slides and get them to work. So this, the first slide for you today is um, an ordnance survey plan with the red dot um, denoted as the application site. It shows it relative to the A1, which is in pink, um, running through the middle, um, relative to Belf Belford on the west, um, the industrial estate on the right, with the residents located at the site entrance. 
this site location plan with the application site denoted with the red line relative to um, the existing business premises, um, the existing business premises of Tree Locate, which are looking to relocate in their entirety to the new site to allow them to expand their businesses um, for manufacturing purposes. An aerial photograph just showing the relative proximity between the application site to the um, Belford Industrial Estate um, and the residents which are located um, on the corner there. Um, proposed site layout plan showing the location of the, the new um, manufacturing building um, laid out with car park and areas for staff and visitors. Um, green denoted uh, for proposed bonding um, and a Suds Basin. Access is proposed from the B6349. Um, elevations, um, I think the materials that are proposed are king span dove grey panels um, with uh, timber panelling and expansive glazing to the, to the west elevation. The west elevation faces towards um, Belford. Uh, it's the floor plan there um, with the entrance to the building, there's office space, manufacturing space, also um, a spray area for the um, painting of planting and, and foliage. There's also storage ware, warehousing um, and the loading bay. Some photographs, um, just take you through some photographs of the site. So this is standing at the A1, um, looking back towards the application site. You can see it's agricultural land. Sorry, it's sticking. I'm just panning round to the, pound, round the site, panning round to the south in a moment. Apologies, Chair, the, the wizard sticks. Okay, this is standing on the grass verge, the A1, looking back to Belford um, Industrial Estate. You can just see the rooftops of the residence properties there. You can just see next to the traffic signs, there's um, the residents, the five residents that live on the, on the corner, the residential properties there with the industrial estate behind. It's just standing a little bit further back on the on the A1 further south. And that's just facing um, facing south um, along the A1. You can see the, the hedgerow uh, to the side there um, and the land rising up towards, towards the site. This is standing on the other side of the road, looking back towards the application site. This time from the B6349, looking into the site from the um, site access. Yeah, this is standing on the B6349, looking um, back towards Belford Industrial Estate um, and the, the tree line hedgerow and the road looking in that direction. Okay. Just a couple of extra slides there was just to show you the extent in pink of the Belford Conservation Area uh, relative to the application site with Belford Hall listed building in yellow. And the hatched area um, is the registered park and garden and the extent of the heritage asset there. It's just point of clarification, uh, so it's clear where, where those are. Right. That concludes the slides, Chair. Um, if I can pass over to Rob um, to set some context. Mr. Murphy. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, I do apologise to new members of the committee uh, that this is straight into a really complex application. Uh, the first application uh, 
raised the same sort of issues in terms of the way the decision needs to be made, but this, this application is much more of a strategic question where you'll be looking at weighing up the harm versus benefit, and the benefit is very much at the county level to do with a unique Northumberland company who was one of the success stories of the entire county, uh, and their particular needs and the tension that throws up. I'll just, I, I won't lead you by the hand in the same way as it last time, but I will draw your attention to certain points in the committee report. Uh, from page 28 onwards, we go through the consultee responses. Uh, and I won't dwell on any of those particularly, that just to emphasize that the, uh, that the parish council, having weighed this up uh, at, over a protracted period, are now in support of this application. Uh, with the number of concerns they've got which are reflected in the conditions. Uh, the final section on the table in section six is the Highways England issue. And Highways England for new members are a government agency outside uh, the direct control and influence and area of responsibility of the local authority. They're the body who look after the national highway network. So they focus on the motorways and the A roads, okay. This application has been with us for an extended period of time and the difficulty we have faced is, is irrespective of the decision, we wanted to make sure that the highway issues have been tackled properly. So there were both, there were both local highway issues in terms of the design of the access, but then there's the impact on the A1. And Highways England have imposed what we call a holding objection on this scheme. And what that means is that they've used their role to say, do not make a decision on this until we are happy with it. Okay. If you make the decision to approve this application, the actual approval does not take place, take place today. That takes place when we issue the decision notice, when the various legal agreements have been made, and Highways England have the right to veto over that effectively. So we've got Highways England to the position where they, in principle, uh, are happy with this now, but they will require, effectively, the final oversee and sign off of the various legal agreements, okay. Right, uh, I'll take you then to page 31, and as per my training sessions, uh, I'd also draw attention to that the, the starting point here, or when it says on paragraph 7.1, is that what the development plan says about this, however. This, and I apologise for this, but there's no way of saying this isn't complex. This is complex because we have the former district plans which are adopted and various elements of, the been, of them have been saved, so they are the development plan. There's a new local plan which is entering its final stages and indeed tomorrow the public consultation on the final modifications to the plan to make it acceptable for adoption starts for an eight-week period. And then we have the issue particularly of the national planning policy framework. So. We go through then the principle of this development because it is, it is an unusual request. And we go through page 32 onwards, we look at the, the, well, the basic premise behind this. And what you effectively need to distinguish here and differentiate, because this is a difficult one, okay, is there's a paragraph I'll particularly draw your attention to, paragraph 7.1.8. And that really sets out the tension we are facing here, that paragraph 84 of the National Planning Policy Framework states that planning policies and decisions should recognise that sites to meet local businesses and community needs in rural areas may have to be found adjacent or beyond existing settlements and in locations that are not where will serve our public transport. You know, that's the national policy here. Okay. What that's getting at is where it is really justified in terms of local economic need, there can be justification to locate an expansion to a business park outside an existing business park or outside a settlement. Okay. What you really need to challenge yourself on is sometimes we will get applications we will bring to this committee with a recommendation for refusal where almost anecdotal evidence is presented saying that a developer, a house builder, can't find another site and they need this site and it's going to have significant economic implications okay, if they don't get that permission. Here, the advice in this report 
is that, well, we have really pushed the applicant on this and just said, don't just say this is an important uh, site you need for expansion. Give us the evidence. So they have provided additional information on both their business needs, and this was touched on in the late ob objection, in, and also we have looked at where else realistically could this development go. So we've done a quite broad area of search with their particular needs in mind and the conclusion is that this is the most suitable site for them. We have triangulated that with advice we have taken from the County Council's regeneration and growth functions uh, and said if this was a new inward investment case, would this be a compelling argument? And, and the conclusion is that the evidence that's been provided does pass that test. So my suggestion to you, when we talk about that weight versus balance issue here, is fundamentally that the economics here isn't just an assertion. It has been really well evidenced, uh, and both in terms of site opportunities the need to maintain the local employment and skilled base, the issue that this company is dual located in here and abroad. And sometimes you hear, I would, I would suggest, empty threats that if we don't get what we want, we will move. Clearly, this firm operates in two countries already. Uh, and we regard the risk of losing the firm as being something that is worth placing weight upon, OK? As we go through the various policies, then, we then look at, so okay then, what policy support is there for this? Uh, and again, with the issue that the existing development plan is well out of date and the new development plan isn't quite yet there yet, you can place weight on what those policies say and the conclusion is you can take support from those policies. But that, well, that line I mentioned to you, this is important, and again, I won't be going through this on every application, but that paragraph 7.1, about applications need to be determined in accordance with development plan. That sort of presumption of it's either in or it's not, you should approve or not as a starting position. The weight you can attach to that is more limited than it would be normally because by virtue of the fact that the existing plan is out of date and the new local plan isn't quite there. So I'm going to advise you to look at the national planning policy framework and that test which is set out, I'm going to jump, at paragraph 7.18, which says that government recognises that in rural areas particularly, there may need to be the need to reflect particular requirements of, of particular business. Okay, right. The report then goes through looking at the likely impacts on that harm side of the balance and with the conditions, including their very extensive conditions on landscaping, etc., uh, that is regarded to be acceptable. I will take you then to the conclusion, okay? And this, like all applications, is a weighting exercise of benefit versus harm. But however, here, we have taken a lot of trouble to make sure that the, the benefits that we are saying are there are real benefits and they are not just, you know, hand-waving exercises by, by the developer. Uh, and so, let's be clear, is that existing emerging em, existing policy and emerging policy and the national planning policy framework absolutely does not preclude us granting planning permission for what we call windfall employment sites. In other words, it's sites that come along and become apparent they are needed because of the natural function of the economy. Okay. So what you have to be careful, so what you need to assure yourself of is, is the argument that, that it, is, it is needed, has that been made? Okay. And I would suggest that you place, this is a matter for you, but I would suggest you place significant weight on the fact that this is in a location of the county where economic resilience post-COVID and post the loss particularly of the European agricultural subsidies is that we cannot rely purely on a tourism-based economy. Okay? From that statement follow implications and consequences. And this is one of them. This is a firm that wasn't, wants to expand. It is a firm that's doing well, and we have evidence that, and we've looked at that. Uh, and so you have to ask yourself then, 
Are you convinced by the argument, and then the report's gone through that, uh, the officer's evaluation on this is that it is a compelling argument. Okay. Finally, and I don't want to venture into the what-ifs, when we did the local plan, we have to, in some sense, take a strategic step back for you and saying, on average, given the population, will more employment land be needed you know, in the medium term in this part of the county? And at that time, we did think it was needed. However, that was before we properly understood the requirements of the applicant, tree locate. And also, I'd emphasize that before we started the very, very lengthy negotiations with Highways England, we were always concerned that an expansion of the business park onto the other side of the A1 could have been ruled out by Highways England's uh, objections, which we couldn't have addressed. What Highways England have fundamentally said is they are not in itself concerned about growth on both sides of the A1. This is the, this is the, the nuanced point here. They are concerned about tree locate having their existing site and opening a new site and then, because of its operational manufacturing plant, having forklifts and equipment and people ferrying back and forth all the time across the A1. Okay. That was their real concern. It's not, it's not to do with the overall volume of traffic. It's to do with that cross A1 movements. So what we've done, and it's an unusual step, is that the applicant has signed a legal agreement, which has been processed at the moment, where they will give up and not use their existing site when their new site becomes online, when they can expand into it. Uh, and that addresses the strategic problem from Highways England, OK? So if we cannot get that legal agreement signed and Highways Eng England aren't happy with it, irrespective of any, of any decision today, the scheme won't go ahead, OK? But that has been the fundamental sticking point, and this is why uh, this application has taken so long to get sorted out because it was always a strategic issue, but that issue has been resolved now. Uh, up and down the county, we are facing similar problems with Highways England over their, you know, of their relationship with us and our growth aspirations. But in terms of this application, it is now sorted, OK? The conditions that go with this, you know, are extensive and detailed. And my final point is that when we're talking again, I'll keep coming back to this, you know, in perpetuity now when we look at planning committees. Look at that balance, benefit versus harm, and the conclusion I sets out the view. Uh, the conclusion sets out the view that we consider that the overall benefit for a locally extremely significant employer who is growing is found a new site in the county. Okay. Does that Thank you, Ron. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Mel, you've been. Yeah, yeah. What, what Mel was just saying then was that the, the unilateral undertaken, undertaken for the applicant to vacate their existing site is still being negotiated because clearly they are trying to make, make sure that operationally it, meets the, operationally it meets their requirements so they don't have to close their existing site, arguably on the, on the day they start to construct their new site. And we are negotiating the trigger point to when the existing site ceases use and the new one comes on, but we are hopeful that negotiations can be completed satisfactorily on that. Okay. So just to be clear, any decision you make today, if you were to decide to approve, uh, we would still need to uh, conclude those final negotiations with Highways England. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you. To the, um, the public speaking slots, and again, we have um, one slot for this application. It's a supporter. Um, the gentleman's name is Jonathan Wallace. Sir, you've got five minutes to speak in support of the application. Over to you. Th thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wallace from Litchfields, and we're the agents for the planning application. Uh, I'm here today because 
Mr. Mark Nesbitt of Trelook, who's the applicant, um, is unfortunately away on business, um, which, which he, as you'll hear from the, the script I'm about to read, um, he, he is he's away quite a lot. So he's asked me to make this short statement on his behalf. Tree Locate is a leading manufacturer and distributor of artificial trees, flowers and foliage, serving clients across the UK and also internationally. The business was established in Northumberland 25 years ago and we are based on Belford Industrial Estate, though we did open a second site located in Dubai in 2013 to deal with increased demand for our products across the Middle East. Since 2019, we've exported to 34 countries and through the proposed relocation and expansion of our business, we're looking to increase our exports to 25% of turnover over the next five years. Our client list is already impressive and includes Euro Disney, Disney, Four Seasons Hotel Group, plus numerous other theme parks, hotels and shopping malls throughout the UK and Europe. We've been based at our current site in Belford since 2005, but have expanded and diversified over time. We originally started out as an importer and a manuf sorry an importer and a dis distributor of artificial trees and flowers, but subsequently moved into manufacturing, which has been a great success. This expansion, while clearly very positive, has taken place on the back of piecemeal expansion at our existing site, and it's not sustainable for us as we continue to grow. Our manufacturing building is not well related to the other buildings on the site, and the internal layout of the buildings is no longer suitable for our, our needs. In fact, we've we've simply outgrown it. These issues, alongside a pressing need for more space, particularly in relation to manufacturing and processing, are the key drivers behind our need to relocate to new purpose-built premises. At present, we have to rent additional storage space to fulfil larger orders on sites elsewhere in the county, including in Wooler and Cramlington. But as well as being inefficient, this represents an additional and unnecessary cost which are a burden upon the business. We therefore have a need to develop new purpose-built premises suitable for our needs and of a scale which will enable us to meet our aspirations to grow the manufacturing side of the business. Given that around two thirds of our employees live in the Belford Middleton area and that many walk or cycle to work, it's important to us that we locate the new premises in the Belford area and ideally as close as possible to our existing site. As a family owned, owned and managed business, our employees are very important to us. Without them and the skills and commitment they bring, Tree Locate would not be the growing and thriving business that it is today. And for this reason, we've always been clear that we could not leave them behind by relocating the business to a larger town like Berwick or Cramlington. At this point, I'd just like to move off the script that Mr Nesbitt gave me and just comment on the objector that we heard from earlier. Um, I don't think Mr Nesbitt would agree with the characterisation of what's happened to his workforce, but as you'll have been, be aware through COVID-19, the many businesses have, have had to make decisions in terms of workforces over the last 18 months. So I think it's fair to say there has been fluctuation in his workforce, but that's now rebuilding to levels that were normal pre-pandemic. Pre and Mr Nesbitt certainly expects his employee numbers to grow over time. So in closing, I would emphasise that we appreciate this is not a development proposal which was envisaged at the time the local plan was being drafted. However, it's a proposal which seeks to respond pragmatically to the needs of a successful and growing North Northumberland business a business which employs over 50 people in a rural area with few large em employees. It's also a proposal which has met all the requirements of planning policy, and we've been happy to agree to all the mitigation requested, including the unilateral undertaking requested by Highways England, in order to ensure that our scheme is one that officers can support. And Mr Neb Nesbitt asked me to close by stating that Tree Locate very much look forward to working with your officers to deliver the scheme over the next 12 to 18 months. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr Wallace. Many thanks. Right, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, we now come to the part of our plan process where we ask questions to the planning officers. Any members got questions they'd like to ask? Georgina. Thank you. OK, so this one, I'm a little bit the harm benefit, a little bit more steering towards can see the, the harm in this. Um, I think as a, a general policy, this has happened in other applications when rural areas, which have obviously a particularly unique characteristic and the whole you know, farming industry is uh, characterises those neighbourhoods and then moving to industrial, I think is is an area fraught with, with concerns. One issue particularly is noise. One of the objectors talked about the noise. Um, can you tell me a, 
how you mitigate it? Is it true that there's significant noise from this site? Do residents have grounds to be concerned? Is there a noise report done by the applicant's old consultant that we shouldn't, for obvious reasons, shouldn't give too much weight to? Can you just talk yeah. to me about the noise issue? Yeah, yeah. Uh, very quickly, uh, we've worked very closely with our public protection team on this application. I pass over to Hayley for this one for the details of. Yeah, that's quite right. So, um, in terms of public protection, they've they've considered the the construction aspects. They've looked at the operational aspects. They have looked um, to ask for more information um, in how the business works, what the activities are on site, um, and they've come to the conclusion that the proposal um, is acceptable in terms of in terms of noise. Yeah. There are obviously reference to the current site, and there's a reference to substantial noise from the current site, which you would, logical conclusion would say they'd be the same in the, or worse because it's an expansion. So what do we know of the noise in the current site? Yeah, Crush coming here, uh, one thing. Mm -hmm. One of the issues with the existing site is, first of all, it is directly adjacent to the grain processing plant, so noise uh, is... It's always difficult to you know, differentiate the noise sources. But it was something that was mentioned uh, by the applicant's uh, speech, is at the moment the site is a relatively uh, crammed in yet old-fashioned site layout where there's lots of stuff takes place outside, lots of activities take place outside. The new scheme shows that predominantly all the activities will take place within structures, and that is possible because they're having a larger site where they can have a bigger footprint building on it. Because at the moment there are, because I've visited, because this is, you know, this is a significant application, and I've walked around, and usually I've walked around this site and looked at the activities taking place on there, and it is a disparately set up site, and they're having to double handle material, move things around, have deliveries in from satellite, uh, storage facilities in other parts of the county. So having all of the activities within one modern unit will offer advantages in terms of how it can be managed and in terms of all impacts, in terms of you know, noise, traffic, the lot. The lot. Okay. Yeah. Yes, of course. How watertight can we get a um, condition that the other site has to close uh, so, for example, yeah. could could they apply to keep the existence one, or for in maybe just in five years' time, could they say actually we like the site? How how watertight can we make yeah. it that they don't have both sites? Yeah, this is uh, this type of issue uh, could be covered by a condition. However, with working with Highways England, Highways England need the absolute assurance that this won't be by a planning condition that can be varied. It is by a legal agreement that Highways England are going to be uh, party to uh, and they will be making sure that it is watertight as well because this is what's taken the time is, is us being able to give Highways England comfort that this site will be moved, operating and there'll be no cross flow between them because that's what they are fundamentally concerned with. Uh, we need to be clear so members aren't under any illusions here. We're not talking about their existing site being grassed over and not being used. Their existing site will form part of the business park and be, you know, hopefully be reused by another firm. But just to be clear, the problem is, and also as has been, if you have a firm that just split over two halves of the A1, you'll be having movements across it and slow moving movements. And that's what Highways England have been really pushing us. And we have been, to put not too fine a point on it, we have been in negotiation with Highways England for a very protracted period to get them to where they are confident that we can control this by this legal agreement process rather than by using a condition. So just a quick prediction, there's not going to be a situation where they say, oh no, this is just used for offices, no, no, this is just for offices, and then neighbours ring up and say, I'm seeing lorries going back and forth, and they go, no, no, they tell us that it's not, it's just offices. Yeah. And we've had similar cases like this, and yeah. enforcement tend to believe the applicant, yeah. not residents. This, yeah, and I would just say, this is why, this isn't being done by condition, this has been done by formal legal agreement, uh, and Highways England... Uh, have, yeah, I'll restate it, have required a lot of reassurances that this will be enforceable and stick. Yeah, and that's why we're using the, the vehicle we are using. Okay. 
Thank you. Any more questions? Councillor Hutchinson, then Councillor Reid. Thank you, Chair. Haley, could you give us details of the screening of the potential site? They've proposed Bundan to the to the front, um, but I don't believe we have. Well, I don't think we have any elevational details of the Bundan with the application. It is proposed um, on the site plan, and its purpose is to partially screen the building, um, and that's in recognition that there is an identified harm here. That we are acknowledging that we are accepting that there will be some harm to the to the um, to the landscape and to heritage assets. Uh, the applicant has offered some screening, but I don't have elevational details. That could be something that we could work into a condition, Rob. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just trying to think if we yeah, have. There are, there are reserved matters on this for mm -hmm. us to finalise the precise details of the landscaping. Uh, and yep. uh, landscaping is always a, a process of agreeing the plant varieties which offer the most physical screening as against, you know, obviously if you did that, you just plant lay land eye uh, along plastic the, trees. yeah, uh, or plastic trees, which they've got plenty of along the front. Uh, but it's about having the biodiversity interest as well. So we, we try and balance up strong biodiversity value with screening. And what we've done here as well, as Haley said, it isn't just planting trees, plants, uh, there's an elevated bonding as well mm -hmm. to take up the starting point for that. So the landscaping will, will hopefully soften the entire development. And I would say, I think it's worth noting that it isn't just visibility, is that the building itself is of a better quality than you would see on a generic industrial estate. And it's been designed you know, to be a, you know, a modern sales pitch for the county as well in terms of being a, a modern factory. And is the bonding only on the entrance side of the building, or is it on the A1 side as well? I was just going to say, it's the, um, it's the darker green, so it's along the B6349. So it's that sort of uh, uh, the darker green shading, uh, which goes wraps around the, the car parking along that side. Yeah. Right. There Thanks. Is a, Thanks very much. I was just about to say, there is a condition for landscaping, um, condition 21. It's whether you wanted to put anything further in respect of uh, Bundan specification. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Reid. Thanks, Chair. Um, when, when I read the report and when Mr Murphy was talking, I thought that Highways England's objection was going to be that they're going to dual the A1, and that might actually be in the wrong place. But what Highway, Highways England are saying is they don't want people scootling across back and forward. Yeah, Has there been... Like I mean, we have been promised that the A1 will be dualed, and that bit isn't. So is there enough room there to get a dual carriageway through it? The, uh, the majority of the duelling route is within existing corridor of the A1. Highways England have been consulted on this, and we are at the moment, we've just gone through the hearings uh, on the duelling, and uh, Highways England are comfortable with this design. Uh, so all I can say is, is they haven't done their precise final engineering final designs yet, but they've looked at the extent and the footprint of the largely dual carriageway, uh, and they are happy at this stage with it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Because um, yeah, because you say that we are, it's that we are directly involved within the planning department within the dueling project as well. So there's you know there's cross conversations yeah. taking place. So could I just suggest then, when it comes to it, if we decide to grant this, that we we'll make absolutely certain. That there is enough room, yeah, what because we'll, that would just be really, yeah, really yeah, bad, wouldn't yeah. it? What we'll, yeah, what we'll do is, it's the, it's, it's that the, that the corridor of the A1 here, if you look, there's a fair margin of space to go out between you before you hit the actual, you know, red line boundary of it. But I would say what we'll do, just to add the add the, add the belt belt and braces for this, that when we communicate with Highways England after this meeting if you are decided to mind recommendation for approval, that we will open up the first sentence with, 
you know. Uh, yeah. There is enough room. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We we assume that you are still. I think what we'll do. I won't. I won't give Highways England the reason for the two-year delay. I'll say, yeah, we assume that as per the public the public hearings that have taken place on the dueling project, that you are satisfied. That your comments, uh, that that your comments in relation to this scheme, uh, apply uh, under any scenario being considered for the A1 dueling engineering works. Or worse, that affect Haley. Yeah. Thank you. Next question from Martin. Martin, over to you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could just go back to screening a moment. Um, I'm curious that there isn't um, uh, a response from the AONB um, that I can see in the in the uh, in the report. Um, obviously, the view from um, from the north. Where, where we've got the, the gardens and the, the listed assets, etc., um, is is going to be screened. But from the um, from the east, um, it would appear from from what I can see that there is no screening going to be in place. Is that so? To the A1 side, yeah. um, is 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 there going to be no planting there at all? Yeah. yeah. Uh, could it be clear that the uh, that the A1 corridor is heavily vegetated anyway. Uh, and that, remember, in between, let's say, in between that site and where the AOMB is in the coast, that you've got the existing uh, north, uh, the grain processing factory there, which falls in between it. So, given the height of this building, uh, I would suggest that the visual impact here doesn't make material worse, the fact that there's a very large and tall uh, grain processing plant on the other side of the A1, which which, which has more effect on the uh, AUMB. Given the screening, and Haley set out there's going to be a new bund right, and screen. The reason why that bund is shown there is because at the moment there is no sort of highway verge uh, elevation difference at all. So you are at level on that road on the north on the to the north of the site. So that's why we want to beef up the screening. From the A1, the corridor is, I think as you've seen from, you can go back to your photographs, the view from the A1. You see from the road, you can see that, you know, it's level access. We see from the, let's see, see. It's be in. So the existing hedge row along yeah. the A1 will be retained. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What we can do is, is that when, uh, uh, if you are minded to do this, what we might do, Haley, mm -hmm. is, is we will just do a very quick revisit of a wider viewpoint when we look at the submission for the tree planting and the uh, uh, landscaping works, just to make sure that we are happy that from every angle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure the, applic well, the applicants here, you'll be happy to accept a review of any, any and all landscaping provisions if it is needed on the basis of uh, evidence. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Martin, you want to come back? Yeah, well, it, I mean, I know the site and the area very well because um, I used to work at Coastal Grains many, many years ago, so I know it very well indeed. Um, the point is that, that, that now the, the screening to the, uh, to the right hand side as you go north up there, one is very good um, around that industrial estate. You can barely see the silos yeah. from the close view. And obviously with the rural locality of the, the location, from the, from the longer view you can see the industrial estate, mm. but from the close view you don't, you don't see it at all. So um, just to, to try and soften a bit on the left hand side as you go north there, um, to have some, uh, some planting would be, I think would be, would be helpful. Yeah. Because um, coming to the other stage, and what we do normally, right, and if we were in a, uh, an area where landscape impact was unusually a significant issue, and I'm not downplaying the landscape culture around here, but the, but, the, but the county has some very, very high landscape value areas, and in that we would do a short, medium, and long, longer-term viewpoint when we were looking at uh, landscaping provisions. What we can do here, if members just want to add on a tweak to the condition uh, on the rest on the landscaping, to, to along the lines of uh, to reflect 
both short and longer views into the site from all logical viewpoints, Haley. Yeah. Because, because there may be one or two, the point, I think you're making a good point actually here, because there, because sometimes you can have very distant views from a certain part of the highway out somewhere, you may catch a glimpse of this from a distance, and we will look at, because there could be sometimes a very limited intervention in terms of the landscaping works to address a particular view from a particular distance. So we will look at that, okay? Thank you. Yeah. And just a final point, Chair. Um, I can't see anything with regard to electric vehicle charging points on the <coughs> application. Is there any information about that? Is there a condition on that, sorry, Haley? <coughs> uh, we, we do habitually put them on. Uh, we, we will be putting them on more applications when the local plan is in place, uh, because that gives us, the, gives us the leverage to require them. Uh, I take it that the applicant wouldn't resistant to a scheme to be discussed in terms of an appropriate level of electric vehicle charging because we'll have to look at the layout of the car park etc are you okay with that okay so there's there's not a condition yeah um, okay we'll have one of those we can yeah, pause okay yeah uh given that the applicant is here and has not an agreement uh that's a shortcut for us not having a formal new policy to require it but he's a but he but he'll have to break the news to his client <laughs> yes <laughs> Okay, we'll have one of those as well. Eh? Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Could I just, before you move on to your discussion, and I thought Georgina was going to go here when she started this, about the tension between a rural location, fundamentally, and without wanting to really overcook this, is a lot of this report isn't just about saying is it okay in policy terms to go for an expansion of an industrial site into the open countryside here, which it is from a policy perspective. It's saying, is actually this a one-off? And that's the real message from this. And this is why you, we wouldn't normally, in this sort of location, in this sort of development, require the applicant to go to the lengths they have, effectively to look at every single site that's available in a certain radius, and for us then to cross uh, for us to reevaluate that independently to make sure that they weren't just saying this is more co commercially convenient for us and cheaper. They have looked elsewhere and we are satisfied that that process was done exhaustively. Okay. Thank you. So it is. So what I'm saying is that this doesn't set a precedent, even though there's no such thing in planning terms as a precedent, but this doesn't set a precedent as such. It says that to get a recommendation for approval, there is a high bar to get over. And this is why this report approaches the issue in the way it does. Okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the committee, if there are no more questions, we'll move to the debate. Could I ask for someone to move a recommendation? Well, the local member actually has his hand up, so I think I'll go to him first. Guy Ryan Thompson? Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'd like to move approval of this, of this application uh, on as it is written in the report. Very good. But with the inclusion of... Yes. Can I just clarify? Um, Councillor Renner thompson um, obviously the recommendation in the report was updated at the start of the committee. Yes. I don't, so I don't know if you want to hear that again, just for clarification, or are you happy with what... If, that's what, this, if that's what you're recommending as the solicitor... Uh, it's the recommendation as was written and was read out to us at the start of the meeting. It may be for everyone's benefit, Chair, if, if it's yeah. just read okay. out again, yes. I think. Oh, good, good. Are you going to read that piece out? The recommendation as it updated, that this application be granted permission subject to resolution of the objection by Highways England, the following conditions contained within the report, any additional conditions required by Highways England, with the wording of the same to be delegated to the Director of Planning and a unilateral undertaking pursuant of Section 106 of the Town and Country Planning Act to secure the following legal obligation. Tree Locate Limited will cease all operations within the current site once they have taken occupancy of the new site. Just Thank to you. complicate matters a little bit further, obviously um, during discussion, during the debate, there's been two additional 
um, conditions or amendments uh, mentioned. The first was the amendment to condition 21 regarding landscaping. Yeah. Um, in respect of uh, revisiting that um, from all logical directions, I think was mentioned. Oh, short, short, medium and longer views, I think you used the term, yeah. Appropriate short, medium and longer views. Do you want to uh, propose that amendment? Indeed, yes. And also there was a uh, mention of, was it an additional condition an additional or an amendment? Condition. An additional condition in respect of electric charging, charging points. points. Yeah. Uh, could I say uh, we have standard model conditions for that and could you delegate to me the wording of that and I'll run it past the chair to make sure he's happy with the wording of that condition. So the, the proposal would include um, the standard um, electric charging point condition uh, with the exact wording to be delegated yeah. to the Director of Planning uh, in conjunction with the Chair. Yes. Thank you. Yes. This um, the issue of the agreement, the way I'm thinking, and I've got some legal training, it has caused me quite a lot of concern. I mean, say, for example, because obviously planning applications attached to the land... So say, for example, so there were two pieces of land that we'd have permission to do this sort of activity. If they were to sell to another business and then to buy that business back, then you would still have the problem. I, I just think there's lots of either deliberate, cynical, or just the way... I think this is going to be a legal minefield, the more I think about it, to secure yeah. this. Particularly, what? not just immediately, you might go, yeah, immediately we sorted it out, but down the road? I do think... You, Melanie, do you see um, where I'm coming from? Yeah, I think every possible um, extrapolation that you can imagine will probably be considered. Obviously, Highways England, as um, Rob Mervyn has said, has taken a lot of time and consideration over this, so I don't think they're going to agree to anything that's you know, not going to be... Watertight. Watertight for them, and, and obviously we will ensure that as well. I know they're still ongoing. It's still ongoing, so, I mean, if it's not agreed, it'll have to come back to committee anyway. Yes. So. Okay. That, that's now the big concern for me. Yeah. That Rob almost taught me the other way, but right, okay. Yeah, it's... it's I, I, for your comfort, I would say that Sometimes issues like this we would look to control via condition. But clearly there is an appeal against the condition and you can make a Section 73 application to vary a condition. Uh, Highways England, and we agree, that the, the most robust way of securing this is by a legal agreement because then, we, then it is at Highways England's discretion whether they ever agree to it being changed or not. Okay. Just to clarify, they're appealing against that condition. No, no, I said no. no I said no, no. I said if we did this via right. condition, I'm saying it would be less robust for the reasons you're getting at because you can the day after you get your decision seek to vary a condition. Right. So, but what this is doing, this is this is insulating the decision against that uh, possibility. So you know, what we're saying is that we are. Yeah. Most applications you see only use legal agreements for things like affordable housing contributions. Here we are using legal agreements to address this particular issue. And this, is, and, and this has, again, as, as the local member has, has known, that this is what has taken a long time to get sorted out with Highways, Highways England. Because Highways England actually wanted the application changed and resubmitting because... Because I think, to begin with, uh, just through the initial... Because they had to change agents. Uh, they were saying that they wanted this as an expansion space. And Highways England fundamentally were unhappy with that. So the entire application had to be revisited and started again on the basis of a new site and the existing one closing. So we have, so we have looked at this from uh, all reasonable perspectives. And we are confident, as confident as you can be, that this is tied up. Okay. If... If members can say were minded to refuse on this basis, the, the, 
there is only one other step that I could recommend to you, and that would be to make this a personal permission to tree locate rather than being a general permission on the land. But that throws up other issues as well. Okay. I think, though, my advice to you is that the approach taken is a robust one. And as Mel alluded to, I wish Highways England were more flexible for 99% of the time, but, they are, but they, are, they are getting us to go over lots of hoops with this, uh, and they will not just accept something which they think is just a piece of paper and then can be circumvented. You know, this is a real issue to them. The A1 is a high-speed a high route. And as I said, what's been concerning them is the worry of low-speed traffic going against across it, and that's what they've all the way through. That's what they've been trying to resol you know, resolve. Okay. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Um, so this application has been moved by Councillor Guy Ryan Thompson. Is it seconded? Councillor Dodd, you're, you're seconding the application. Thank you very much indeed. Right, ladies and gentlemen, the application is now open for debate. Um, who would like to speak to the application? Councillor Richard Dodd. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It's it's quite strange sitting at the back because you feel as if you're out of the meeting, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and make a contribution. We'll try and bring you in, Councillor Dodd, yeah. always. Come on down. I know yeah. you're used to sitting on the top table. It must have been <laughs> quite strange being at the back, but I'm sure that won't inhab inhibit your contribution, sir. Right. Um, the head of planning used to always say at, at various meetings that the only way to get growth into an economy is via planning. And we seem to be going through a lot of hoops here to get this. Um, you know, let's face it, every other county will be applying or hoping to get new factories or jobs or jobs in certain areas like this one. So I, I'm really keen to get this on the road, as it were. Uh, if, if you do have to enter an agreement into planting trees, please, in this rush for everybody thinks that planting a tree is going to save the planet, do not plant trees at the side of a road because they grow. And they grow into big trees that then cars bash into at some point. So be a little bit sensitive on what you're actually putting down the side of a road. Uh, uh, you know, and if I was this company, if you uh, make green plastic trees, I'd stick one on the top of your factory to, sh to show the world what you do. Uh, a green tree next to a trunk road. Thank you, sir. More contributions? Georgina. I'm sure I'm not going to persuade anyone else. I'm just um, following on from my questions. I'm just not happy about giving permission. In, I mean, it's like with any negotiation position. You don't say, I'll agree to my side, depending on what the other parties are doing. So that's a bit concerned about the overall harm. But with this condition with Highway England, that's why I would prefer that we were seeing this, we're not considering this now. So that's why I'm going to be objecting, just to be clear. Support, obviously. Businesses that come with the plastic plants, but I'm not. I'm not happy. I think there's going to be problems ahead with this one. That's my prediction. Well, we'll try and be as safe as we can. I promise you. Councillor Barry Flux. Yeah, I wasn't going to speak. It's quite a long way from my division, um, but I have been past it on the A1 and what have we. But um, I just have to feel that I have to support it because we've come with some quite good and strong. Um, conditions here and I wouldn't want to see them lost if we kick this out and then suddenly they appealed and won we would lost all these conditions and all the work we've worked for in this meeting so I'll be supporting that thank you very much thank you anybody else want to speak this afternoon might go to Guy Ryan Thompson then to sum up and sorry oh oh yes, mark yourself you thank you chair yeah, well, as, as someone who, um, I say, I worked at Belford many years ago, um, I know it's a small community, um, it's reliant on agriculture, it's reliant on tourism, and it's reliant on a small amount of, of, of local businesses as well. Um, so 
after everything that's been considered on this application and the harm, and the definitely there is a small amount of harm landscape-wise, but I think on, on balance that uh, we should support the application. Um, it's it's a, a company which uh, was there, in fact, 25 years ago, I believe, um, when I worked there. But um, it's obviously grown. It's obviously uh, got its workforce uh, rooted in the in the community of, of Belford. And uh, I think if we don't uh, allow this, that, uh, that, that will be lost probably from the county, to be fair. Um, and I think that the, uh, the positives outweigh the negatives. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Or Guy, would you like to take the floor? And well, yeah, thank you, Chair. I think the, the previous speaker summed it up quite well. Um, there was some things I was going to say that I don't, I don't need to because they've been said by other speakers. Uh, I would make a strategic point, and I was uh, on Radio Newcastle this morning talking about this. There are some people who think that the, the economy in the north of the county on the coast can be completely dominated by tourism, and tourism is going to be this magic bullet that solves all our problems, but it doesn't provide work for, the, for six months of the year. You know, we, we need an economy which is mixed, that has good manufacturing jobs, uh, 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 as well as the existing agricultural jobs and the, uh, uh, and the jobs in tourism. So that this, this is important to Belford, very important to Belford, and to the wider area as, as an example of a business that can thrive in a rural area not just be reliant on the, the tourist or, or, or agriculture. My, other, my only other final point is that there's been a lot of scary words like factory and, and industrial. This is really just a large steel frame shed. It's not, it's not like a factory where raw materials come in at one end and fake trees come out the other. They're brought onto site and they are made, they are put together on site. And there was reference to a, a smokestack. That's nothing to do with the, uh, uh, the actual manufacturing operation, that was to do with the heating of the building. It's a biomass boiler, I think. So if, if anyone had any concerns about that element of it, um, just to put their mind at rest, it's really just a, 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 an assembly plant rather than a, a manufacturing or a hard industrial plant. And from the pictures, it's going, it, will, it, it will blend in quite well. So I'm, I did have some concerns about the impact on the landscape, but I think the applicants have done a good job to allay those concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So we've had this application moved and seconded with the original recommendation plus the three additions. Are we all happy to move forward on that or do we need those additional conditions read out again? Um, all happy to proceed? Yeah, we understand them? Fine. So all those in favour of this application? Thirteen, and those against? One. One, Georgina. That application is passed. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, the rest of the business for today, um, more or less for information, but still important to note it. Item eight is um, an appeals update. Um, those that have been approved and dismissed on page 53 to 62. Are you happy to receive those? And also an update on section 106 agreements. Um, obviously money that's come in from section 106s. Um, quite a lot there. Um, contributions, but also nice to see we've had a payout as well to Corbridge Tennis Club. Yeah, okay. Councillor Fox, well, you've got yeah. a question on these? Well, I was just going to point out the um, nearly, well, nearly 150,000 on sports c contributions in two different, from Bellway and Persimmon within South West Sector, which is in my, my ward, um, along with further money, I think of about half a million, which was mentioned at Cabinet this morning. There are significant um, sums are going into the area now, and it'll be, you know, I would like to see 
we're probably outside this meeting some updates on exactly what's going on there because with the large numbers of money coming forward I'm now getting lots of questions from my um, constituents. How's it been spent? Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Any comment, Councillor Murphy? Officer Murphy. Yes, Officer Murphy. Yes, sorry. sorry, Officer Murphy. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, what we've tried to do over the last 12 months particularly, we've really ramped up the reporting on, on Section 106. So this is why it's on the committee agendas now and there's an annual report uh, to how it's spent and we have more live information now. So maybe, uh, Council Flux, what this needs is perhaps uh, a quarterly report, in the hate to talk myself to more work, uh, say, say a quarterly report to Cabinet on this. Yeah, that would be useful because I think I'm up to, just in one day, £700,000 being talked about. Yeah. in relation yeah, yeah. to this. Uh, and and it, it is, it I've is had emails flood through already mm. since 10 o'clock this morning. Yeah, it is important yeah. to know how yeah, the is. money's been spent. Yeah. Um, and, you know, yeah. Yeah. and can I just say, the, uh, the, the local plan has been fully viability assessed, so I'm hopeful that we should be more successful in securing and developing contributions as we move forward over the next few years. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is no urgent business. Um, so I'd like to um, thank you all for attending. I hope you've enjoyed the, the first meeting of strategic planning and I look forward to uh, future meetings. Thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you.